So our scope of work right now is to remove all the free accessible hydrocarbons off of Klamagor. This is the material that would rise to the surface if for some reason Klamagor sank. So it's a mitigation for the boat in the harbor and when she's underway for future projects. We're pumping out waste oil from these engines. There's four engines. We're accessing the, uh, the sumps down below to get all the waste oil. The hydraulic systems uh, have oil, so we're draining hydraulics. We're also finding any diesel fuel, fuel oil that was left over from when the ship last sailed. The obvious danger is what we're doing is taking thousands of gallons of oil and, and uh, old diesel off the boat. Now it's not flammable particularly anymore, it's not like it's going to burst into flames, but the real belt and suspenders part is making sure we don't spill anything. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge that's readily met, but you always have to have it in mind to keep it clean, to keep it hygienic, and uh, to be respectful of the environment and don't let a single drop out. We haven't had any problems like that, but that's the type of danger or problems you can run into. The salt water is probably the worst thing for the steel. We're also in a warm place, so warm salty water is the best way to corrode steel if that's your goal. What you have is exterior coatings, basically paints that keep them out and zincs, sacrificial anodes and so forth, but all those are long gone. And essentially the steel surface is just, is just rotting away. With an old vessel like this, like I said, we do have to be concerned about stability. A submarine is essentially a tube within a tube. The inside tube that we're standing on uh, is, uh, is always dry and the water is always on the outside. But the outer tube is what you flood to go down and then you blow air into it, which squeezes the water out of the bottom and makes it go back up. That's how submarines work. But this boat is afloat because of its exterior ballast tanks, which are in tough shape, which is the only reason we're doing this whole process. If the submarine was in fine shape, we wouldn't have to be going down this road. But one of the tricks with the submarines, and the real reason I'm here, is finding where those systems are. This is an amazingly complex boat with layers and layers of different systems all piled on top of one another. It's a ballet and you have to do it right. Uh, every U.S. Navy ship, actually every government-made ship, has what they call the pocket plans. And this is a set of the pocket plans. And it's the general arrangements of all the equipment of the vessel and some specifics on machinery, capacities, and things like that. And then this is the one that's most useful for us. This is the hold level. The Navy did put this boat away well. They, they removed everything they could easily. Um, and, and set her down properly. What they did do actively is they left oil in the crankcases for the engines, and I think that was an attempt to preserve the engines, make them usable later on. Removing the oil from them was difficult, and there was a large amount, over 400 gallons per, per engine. So we're really closing in on the internal areas where there's any fluids left. What remains is the external tanks, which is really your world. Yeah. So in each of the engines, we've got oil. It's lube oil. Same as your car. Same as your car. Uh, there are fuel tanks on the inside. Mm -hmm. There are reservoirs for lube oil. And then what we've been working in the front uh, torpedo room are hydraulic oil. This right here is the tank you just got done. Right. So probably uh, 50, 50 gallons. I think I total, saying. yeah. Aside from the historic facts, so we, we're using these plans very specifically to get in, find the tanks. And this is where Jesse really has the know-how to recognize not only where the tanks are on the plans, but how to get to them. So eventually, we would have found this, but uh, there's the tank. This was a reservoir, so it wasn't waste oil. This is where the, the boat would have stored the new oil. We separated the waste oil from the motors, uh, from the hydraulic oil, from the diesel. Okay. So three waste streams. Each waste stream goes into a container where we characterize it and then ship it off for disposal or recycling. It doesn't just go to the landfill or it gets solidified. It gets burned. What a cool thing about this dipstick, I ain't like the dipstick in your car. It's actually calibrated and lets you know exactly how many guns in it. The fluid level was right about here when we took it out. So we're looking at about 460 gallons in this one. No one even knew what was on here. How much fuel oil, in fact, we, we just made a guess when we started. Um, how much fuel oil, how much oil, so forth. So 
In many ways, we were lucky to find less than we hoped. Really, we wanted to get set up this afternoon so that we would be pumping oil out of Roadrunner. This is the uh, surgical part of trying to decon the ship, just finding the small volumes. Ready to pump when you are. I'm good, I just had to drain the water off the piston. I'm getting ready to start right now, just give me a minute. Here you come. Kind of like chocolate syrup. Got good flow. Right now we're draining the motor oil out of one of the four engines from Flammable. This would have last lubricated the engine in 1975. It's just been sitting there for 40 years now. It's, it's not a complex system. Uh, what you see most of the places are uh, there's a blue hose, which is a small diameter hose, and that goes to a collection tank in, in the uh, forward torpedo room, just a 55 gallon drum. And that's for smaller amounts and the thicker stuff, because the thick old oil is very, very hard to pump all the way from the bottom of the boat to the top of the pier to our, to our waiting containments. So we stage it on the boat and then pump it out again, which is much more efficient in the end because you can actually move it quicker doing it twice. The yellows are airlines, the blue is the small one, the, and the larger white hose that you see going throughout is, is our main feed that does go all the way from the boat to the shore. That's what we use to pump out the engine oil. But we're using air-powered pumps, so there's no electric sparks, there's no gas, there's no nothing like that. Uh, it's efficient, it doesn't add anything to the mix, and uh, there are airlines you see stretched throughout the boat as well to operate the various pumps. Also, the, uh, the hydrocarbon-eating bacteria does require additional oxygen to, uh, to do its job. So um, we have to add bubblers to each one of these spaces. Plus there's a whole ventilation system for the tourists that we have turned down because we want to control where the air is going, but we'll turn that back on when we're done. We use the, the microbes to see if we can get that a little bit better. But, you know, that is not how it would be left if it eventually goes to be towed for a reef. Once all the oil's out, because it's difficult to get down into the bilge, we're gonna use microorganisms to clean out the bilges and the external fuel tanks. So what they, you have is these bacteria that uh, ingest any hydrocarbon, which is any sort of oil um, or, or natural gas or anything like that. And uh, what they produce is water and CO2, and those are both safe. Without anything else to, to eat, they die, and then the whole system can be removed. They just, you know, turn back into carbon. <laughs> now it's a little tricky because they need, uh, you need to aerate and a lot of movement to keep it going, but it is amazingly efficient and it's amazingly clean. It's a brilliant technology. Really, the, the scope of work we're on right now is safety in this harbor and, you know, pre-tow. This is open to the public and it's safe for the public. Everything we're doing, we're making sure it does not in any way uh, impact the public except for the fact that they can't get on while we're doing it. But when it's all done, we're gonna roll up all the paper that we put down on the floor, we're gonna take all the hoses out, we're gonna wipe everything down and so forth. But I cannot certify uh, that this boat is 100% clean. There's piping everywhere. We, in order to get everything out, you have to disassemble everything. The problem is her long-term viability, her survivability is limited. Whatever happens, it wouldn't be one of those incidents where visitors would be hurt because it would take hours and hours or days or weeks for anything to actually go underwater unless there was a major storm event. Or if anything like that happened, it would all be potentially catastrophic for the vessel. And that's why we were trying to get this done as quickly as possible. It's the right first step for the entire project. It's the very first checkbox on the list. Um, and she's more survivable as a result. This whole step, you know, it's, it's kind of pain, painstaking. It's not, you don't make a whole lot of progress compared to just bulk removal. But this is what you gotta do to get it decontaminated.